Hello, and welcome to my talk. My name is Ahmed Fattoum. I am an embedded Linux developer with Pingatronics. We do infrastructure work all around embedded Linux, from system integration to graphic pipeline optimization to kernel and driver development. And some of these drivers use DMA, and over the years I had the joy of uh, writing and debugging them, and I want to share some tales of that with you. So a quick show of hands. Who has uh, well, wasted lifetime debugging or writing driver codes that uses DMA, whether it be in Linux or not? Please raise your hands. Okay, so that's like half. Um, who did it in Linux in particular? Okay, so still uh, half. Who has done this in Linux user space? Okay, <laughs> one. Uh, did you do it using mechanisms like VFIO for IMMU and isolation and safety and stuff? Okay, so it's just be me, and, uh, me being curious. Uh, I will talk about the kernel DMA API in this talk mostly. Uh, so for the half that haven't uh, used the DMA API yet, I have a short primer. I hope to not get bugged too much in the details. So here is a very simplified system. We have um, two CPUs. We have a system memory, which is a slave, which uh, the CPU can read and write. And we have a timer. And the timer is read and written. And yeah, that works OK. So when you access the timer, you do it like you access memory. It takes time. You don't want to cache it. So that kind of defeats the point of the timer. But it's OK if you only access it every few milliseconds. Uh, now, uh, when we have like a uh, network controller, things get a bit different because the network controller might be, have packets for you ready a dozen every microsecond. So PIO is not what you want to dedicate a core for. You don't want to keep reading the packet data register by register and writing it to memory. You would like the network controller to directly access memory, which is DMA. And the way this usually looks like is we have a descriptor ring. Each descriptor has some metadata about the buffer, where it's located, what size it is, some device-specific information, and an ownership bit. And once we have prepared the descriptor ring, we set the ownership bit so it's uh, owned by the device. And then we tell the network controller over its PIO registers, over its MMIO registers, here is the descriptor ring. And when it receives a packet, it walks the descriptor ring. And when it finds a descriptor that's available for it to use, it will DMA into the buffer and signal the CPU, maybe directly, maybe at a later time. And that way, the CPU can spend time actually processing the data and not doing like just memory copying around. Um, it's a nice thing to have, but the main problem that uh, I have run into on embedded system is uh, problems with cache coherence. So you see there is an arrow for the DMA going to external memory. On the left side, we have these caches. And the question is, does memory writes over DMA from the network controller update the caches or not? Or can we reach an inconsistent state? So if we are on an x86 system, the SOC as a whole is cache coherent. That means we do not need to do anything special. So if the data is in caches, it will be automatically updated. But for ARM, it depends on the SOC interconnect. And for most embedded SOCs, it's, yeah, it's not cache coherent. So you have server-grade SOCs that are cache coherent and where you don't need to do uh, manual cache maintenance. But for most embedded SOCs, that's not the case. Here is a small example. So we have these two um, variables, x and y. So x is the old value that's in the cache. And then the device did DMA and wrote y into the external memory. And now we want to get the packet data from the device. So we want to discard, I mean, uh, this is called invalidate. We want to invalidate our stale copy so we can get fresh data. Now, Linux runs on a lot of systems. It runs on cache coherent systems, it runs on caching coherent systems, and it runs on systems that are partially cache coherent. 
And so it's not a solution to manually do cache maintenance in the driver, but you need some better abstraction than that than directly calling architecture-specific code. And the architecture as an abstraction is what the DMA API provides. So we try to explain to the kernel what kind of accesses we are going to do with that memory region and it will provide the necessary um, architecture hooks that implement that. So when we look at this simplified example, we have a descriptor ring. So this, the descriptor ring is walked in parallel by the device and by the CPU. And the CPU is not going to do a lot with it. It's going to fill it out. It's going to set the ownership bit. And then at a later time, it's going to be informed there is packet data ready. So it will read the descriptor once. And yeah, that's it. So we do not lose much by just omitting caching for the descriptoring if it's necessary. And in return, we get a coherent look at the descriptoring where both the network controller and the CPU can use it in parallel. But for the buffers, it's different. The buffers will be read a lot of times while they traverse the network stack. And thus, we want to keep it cached. Uh, this is at the cost of that when we take ownership of the buffer, we need to tell the DMA API, hey, I am moving ownership. So yeah, we have these different kind of accesses and these are mapped in an architecture specific manner. So for coherent memory on x86, there's nothing really you need to do. Everything is coherent. On uh, ARM, uh, on DMA non-coherent ARM, it's different. So in the page tables, there are caching bits and these caching bits need to be cleared, so the memory is uncached. And there is a function called DMA alloc coherent, which will do this for you on ARM. And for the streaming DMA mappings, you need to tell the kernel or you need to tell the DMA uh, um, subsystem, uh, the DMA map API, how ownership is going to move. So when you first take a buffer, you map it, if it's already mapped, you can call sync for device. That means, hey, this buffer now enters ownership of the device. And you can additionally say what kind of DMA you expect. So if you are doing DMA from the device, that means whatever you have in your caches is not important because the device is going to give you data. So you invalidate, meaning you discard the caches. But if you are going to do DMA to the device, you want any stale or any dirty data you have in your caches to actually reach a place where the device can see it. So you clean it, meaning you write back the cache lines. And on the inverse side, there is DMA unmap and DMA sync for CPU, because if you had like a prefetching in the middle and you now have cache lines uh, hiding from you the updated data in RAM, you want to discard these cache lines. And then there are barriers that enforce order, but more on that later. And that's all I want to say about uh, like um, a very brief introduction into the DMA API to make the examples that I have a bit more digestible. So we call, uh, talked about why DMA to offload from the CPU, how DMA, yeah, the simplified descriptor and buffer example. And yeah, the DMA I am going to talk about is uh, DMA API misuse. I won't talk so much about how to use it. There is a good talk from Laurent, even if it's a few years old, it's like 10 years old, I think that you can consult for that. So that, uh, yeah, let's see how to tame DMI testic uh, beasts. So this was the first DMA uh, issue I ran into when I started in Bingotronics uh, some years ago. So we had the system, we had, it had an SD card, it had an eMMC, both were handled by the same MMC host driver and everything was working well. Then new board, larger amount of RAM, and now I get ADMA errors. So from time to time in the kernel log, it says ADMA error, it prints a lot of registers. And yeah, so there is something clearly wrong about the new size of RAM that the driver doesn't like. So you look into the driver and the driver seems itself apparently fully capable of 64-bit addressing. So the descriptors that you give the driver to identify the buffers, have actually two 32-bit registers, so it has full 64-bit addressing capability in theory. But yet, when you limit the memory size to three gigabyte, the issue disappears. Uh, yeah, some of you might already guess what the issue was here. 
the issue was that one, it's one thing what the IP core is capable of, but another thing what's actually implemented in hardware, and actually in hardware, only 40 address lines were actually connected. So you can add, you can insert addresses that are bigger than the address bus, and you will run into crashes if the kernel turns out to give you actually a buffer that's above 40 bits. And the way around is that is that you set the DMA mask. So the driver now checks uh, on these SOCs, uh, checks the compatible, and then it says DMA set mask and coherent, DMA bit mask 40. That means restrict yourself to addresses that are on top 40 bits. Uh, here is a bit more involved example. This happened in Bearbox. So, so we had a TFTP transfer on this given SOC uh, and this given board. So it was this board in particular and the first transfer always broke. So if you ran MD5 sum on the kernel image that you fetch over TFTP, TFTP is like FTP but trivial. It's just a simple UDP based file transfer protocol. And the first TFTP transfer was always broken, and the second, the third, the fourth, they were always correct, and they had the correct MD5 sum. Uh, so the first thing uh, you would think about is looking at the uh, ownership changes. So this sounds like a caching issue if the first is always broken, but the second works. So do we move ownership correctly? And uh, packets are entered into the Bearbox networking stack via net receive. And if you look at net receive, you have before it a DMA sync single for CPU, which makes sense. We are moving ownership to the CPU. The direction is DMA from device, also makes sense. We are receiving a buffer, so it's DMA from device. And afterwards, it's the inverse direction. We are moving ownership to the device, but we still expect that this buffer will be used for DMA from device. So there is no problem here. Uh, my colleague, uh, told the story in our stand-up meeting and another colleague was quick to ask, uh, did you actually transfer ownership to the device? And that was indeed the issue. So uh, to visualize that, imagine you have a buffer, it was returned by malloc, then you freed it, but before that you had done changes to the buffer and now you have dirty cache lines in your cache. That's no problem. You reallocated that buffer again, and this time it was a receive buffer used in the driver. So far, no, uh, that's no problem. It's usual for malloc when you don't explicitly zero it to have old contents. Uh, the problem was that now when the device does DMA, it writes directly into main memory, but these invalid cache lines, these uh, dirty cache lines remain in the cache. And yeah, if something happens and the cache gets too full and cache lines need to be evicted, dirty cache lines are first written out because um, the cache controller on its own can't know if these are interesting cache lines or these are leftover cache lines. The only way you have to actually tell the cache controller that is to do cache maintenance, which was omitted when first uh, mapping these buffers. And yeah, once you know what the problem is, you don't look at the receive path, but you look at the driver probe path, and then you see uh, this abomination, which is a virt to fizz. So what virt to fizz does, it translates from a virtual address to a physical address, but that's not enough. You non not only want a physical address, but you want to invalidate all cache lines you have for this region before you pass it. Uh, pass ownership to the device. So the correct thing would be to use DMA map single, which will, does, which will do cache maintenance for you. And uh, yeah, this issue shouldn't happen under Linux because I hope when you debug issues under Linux or you develop a new driver, you will enable config DMA API debug. And this will keep track of all your DMA mappings and if you call DMA sync single for CPU or for device without having it mapped, it will give you directly a stack trace and tell you, hey, you are syncing a buffer that was never mapped. So in order to re reduce such issues in Bearbox in future, I ported this config DMA AP debug to Bearbox. And now this, um, so the red line before the diff should trigger an error in Bearbox 2. An added benefit of doing it the right way is that we support more gen 
just one-to-one -one map devices. Because as you see, DMA map single, it takes a device parameter, so it can check for example, the DMA mask that we set in the previous example and see if it matches. And it's allowed to fail. There is a DMA mapping error. And if that returns an, uh, uh, positive, if that, uh, if that returns true, that means there is an error and the driver bails out. But before that, we had no check at all for DMA masks because we just used virt to fizz which never fails. Uh, yeah, that's a good uh, occasion to talk about permissible memory for DMA. So, we need, uh, because we might need on some system to do cache maintenance manually, uh, because it's not co coherent, we need to ensure that the start is cache line aligned, so we don't do anything with a previous buffer. So, if we were to start in the middle of a cache line, we might have variables unrelated before it, and then we would either invalidate, meaning we would delete them, or we would flush them, which is not as bad, but yeah, still not what we want. And also the size needs to be cache line aligned. That's also very important because there might be variables after it if you don't round up the size to a cache line. And it needs to be physically contiguous. So uh, in absence of an IO MMU, uh, so the fact that something is contiguous in virtual address space doesn't mean that it's contiguous in physical address space. So that's something um, code needs to make uh, sure of. And uh, something that's uh, often missed is that it needs to be addressable by the device. So there is no guarantee or there is no uh, rule that the device needs to have exactly the same look to the physical address space as uh, the CPU. So for example, it can have less address lines as we have seen, or you can be able to have like aliases that you move around for an on-chip RAM, but you only see these aliases on the CPU side. You might have cached and uncached aliases, so you need to be sure that you are using the device's address space and not just the CPU's physical address space. And if you use kmalloc and DMA map single, uh, you should be on the safe side. kmalloc will either use arch DMA min align to return to you buffers that are cache line aligned, or on ARM64 for the last year or so, it uh, instead selects arch want kmalloc DMA, DMA bounds, which will automatically allocate a DMA bounds buffer and use that if the allocation itself is not a cache line aligned. So as GFP DMA and GFP DMA CRT2, you don't want them probably, you want to set your mask correctly and use the DMA API. And this applies to every buffer you use for DMA. So if you do one kmalloc and split it up, you will need to ensure all of that for every buffer you use for DMA. Uh, yeah, uh, speaking of insuring stuff, the CAM, which is the crypto unit on the Layerscape and IMX uh, SOCs and others, uh, has a self-test mode. You can enable it and it will queue some descriptors, trigger DMA, wait for results, and then try to match the results with what it has queued. And yeah, that's an operation that should not fail. Well, on this SOC, it failed from time to time. And when you inspect the output rings, you see, well, the address is not written or some other field is not written. The address is zero. But you are uh, very sure that you wrote a value different than zero before that into the input ring. Uh, so my colleague Sasha ran into this. And uh, once he has understood the symptoms, he uh, sent a message to the Linux crypto mailing list. Has someone see the, uh, seen this before? And he got a question back. Could it be that your device is coherent and you don't know about it? And I find this very interesting because it changed uh, my, the model I had for cache coherency in my mind. I always thought that the uh, cache coherent systems, you don't need to do cache maintenance. It's done automatically for you. But the truth is you are not allowed to do cache maintenance lest you cause data corruption. Here is an example to visualize that. So you have the MA map. The MA map will flush out the cache lines if you are doing the MA to the device, which is what we were doing. But now this was uh, like um, a server, uh, so more like a, a server CPU, this Layerscape, and it does a lot of speculative execution and prefetching. And it prefetched the buffer we had just flushed 
prefetched it back into the cache. That's no problem. We just have uh, clean cache lines that were prefetched. Now, the device wants to write to the buffer in main memory, but because it's coherent, it snoops the caches first and sees, oh, this cache line is in the cache. So, I direct, so it directly writes into the cache instead of writing into main memory. And now the MA unmap comes around and the MA unmap needs to invalidate the caches on non-coherent systems because exactly of that prefetching, because you could have prefetched data and it would hide from your view the updated data in main memory. And then it comes around, invalidates the cache lines, which happen to be dirty because they have the data from the CPU, uh, from the CAM. And then, yeah, uh, the output, the DMA output of the CAM is partially corrupted because it was only ever in the cache and never in main memory. And yeah, once you understand this issue, the fix was quite easy. It is to write into the device tree, this device is DMA coherent because the kernel was already capable of handling that. You just need to tell it in the device tree. In the meantime, DMA coherent is applied in slash SOC. So top level, all devices are coherent now on this uh, SOC, which brought problems on its own because it broke AB boot. So if you have AB, you are flashing the inactive partition and then you are doing a restart and switching over to the inactive partition, which becomes the active partition. And if there is a problem, you want to fall back to your old system. And if you are trying to fall back to an old system and that old system is not DMA coherent, it has an old device tree that doesn't say I am DMA coherent, but you have a bootloader that configures the snoop bit, so it is DMA coherent, you run into this exact issue. And now you have a new system that doesn't work for some reason, you have an old system that doesn't work either because uh, all things using DMA, which is a lot, it's a SD card controller, it's a network, it's a PCI, it's a uh, there's a DMA controller used for SPI, for I2C, so everything is broken on one side and the other doesn't work. So that's not what you should have in mind when you have an AP setup. So what Bearbox now does is that it dynamically rewrites the DMA coherent property in device trees that it boots to align with what itself does. So if you have an up-to-date Bearbox, it will configure cache coherency for that SOC and will write this information into the kernel device tree. So it's able to boot both old and new device trees. But this uh, shows that even a one-liner in the kernel device tree can break something in a wholly other place and you need, as a system integrator, take care of that. Uh, yeah, a word of warning, you might be inclined to think that because you can stick a DMA coherent property top level that's always inherited. It's only inherited in the device tree. It's not inherited in the device model. So you have, for example, the DesignWare USB 3 controller, and this will create a virtual XHCI device because there is a generic XHCI driver, and these uh, virtual X, uh, HCI devices can be created here by the DVC3 or by uh, XHCI PCI, so XHCI is a generic interface and thus we have hardware specific drivers that create a generic device that's bound to. But if you try to use this virtual device for the MA API operations, it will not give you a correct view of the hardware. It will just say, I'm not coherent. I don't have any DMA limitations uh, because the settings are only in the device tree. So the driver, does it correctly in Linux, it needs to use the parent actually of the device, not the actual device itself. It's yeah, a bit of a pitfall. Uh, yeah, speaking of the DVC3, here is another DVC3 uh, problem. This one was in Bearbox when Bearbox a few years ago was first ported to the rock chip RK356X. Uh, there was a problem whenever you enable the DVC, uh, DVC3 gadget driver it crashed, so Bearbox crashes whenever you receive something over the gadget. So if you plug in a bot running Bearbox on the SOC in your laptop, it crashes. Uh, which is strange because that driver was already there in Bearbox and it worked for a number of other SOCs. So something is seemingly different about uh, the rock chip that it causes issues. Uh, luckily, there is a stack trace and there are call all sims in Bearbox, so you actually get symbolized stack traces uh, 
And if you look at it, you see it's crashing in a mem copy. And the mem copy looks completely normal. If you compare the driver code to Linux, it looks ex uh, nearly the same. It does, uh, yeah, it's, you have a loop and it does mem copy. And the address that it uses is in coherent memory. It's the same way in Linux. So it's supposed to work. The only thing that's odd is the address is four bytes aligned. It's a bit odd to do mem copy on a four aligned, four byte aligned uh, address, but it's not wrong. And Linux does it. So why does it crash in bare box? Uh, and to understand that, uh, we need to take a brief look uh, on memory mapping in bare box. So memory mapping in bare box is much simpler than in Linux. Uh, in Linux, if access order is important, you need to use barriers. So if you just have a single MMIO device, for example, your timer, you can get by with read and write X uh, relaxed, for example, read L relaxed. Uh, these are just volatile accesses. They will be issued by the CPU in that order. And because the kernel will take care to map the device uh, appropriately, they will arrive in order at the device. Now, if you need to synchronize between MMIO and memory, because you did something with memory, and, uh, or you want to make, uh, sorry, you want to make sure that um, your register accesses have reached the device, actually, before you do something else, there are, is a read and write L, which have a built-in barrier. Uh, if you are doing access to coherent memory, there are some more barriers. There is the MA, VMB. That's, for example, if you have an ownership bit in a descriptor, you need to write the descriptor then you do a barrier, then you write the ownership bit, because you don't want to uh, do multiple accesses to a descriptor and they get reordered. And now you just wrote the base address of uh, a buffer, but not the length. And yeah, now you ended up with DMA doing some very wrong access. In Bearbox, you don't need to do any of these barriers because uh, MMIO and DMA coherent regions are strongly ordered. Strongly ordered means um, that you don't need barriers. You have implied barriers in the accesses, but this comes with a downside that strongly ordered memory is not bufferable as opposed to the device memory or the device mapping that Linux uses. Uh, so this is just, uh, uh, don't take this as gospel. So there, are, there is uh, documentation in the kernel. There is a talk from Will Deacon about barriers in the kernel. So this is just for illustration, what needs to be done in Linux uh, in some cases. And yeah, so going back to the problem at hand, we had uh, an optimized mem copy in Bearbox. It did eight byte accesses. It had a comment in it and it said, alignments handled by hardware but to actually handle an unaligned write, you need a write buffer. So your unaligned writes are collected in a write buffer and then they are posted at once in an aligned fashion. And when you do strongly ordered memory, you don't have a write buffer and so you are not allowed to do unaligned accesses. And so the solution is to use memset.io or memcopy from 2.io. I'm not that happy about the solution because a big, uh, uh, very important uh, aspect in Bearbox is that we want to make it as easy as possible to port code from the kernel. But in this case, we win more by not uh, having to do barriers than we lose by having to use memcopy from IO in this place when the kernel can just use normal memcopy. Uh, yeah, here is an info slide that I want to mention uh, nonetheless, even if it's not really a debugging story. So uh, this happens in a lot of projects, uh, I think, that uh, you invest time to secure the system and you have Opti and you set up your trust zone address space controller so Linux can't access Opti running in the secure world. And then you don't secure the DMA masters. And you can trivially just ask the GPU, hey, can you read me secure memory over there? And please put it there. And yeah, then you have circumvented all protections that you have done on the CPU side by just picking one of the DMA masters and asking it nicely. And uh, part of that problem here is um, that the description of how to secure DMA masters it's in NDA protected security reference manuals that you need to request first. 
and often, uh, so Opti has support for some SOCs for configuring uh, fire, the firewalls and stuff, but uh, for many it does not. So if you have a system where you do address-based isolation, you should test if you actually uh, isolate DMA masters. You can do that over JTAG or um, yeah, if you have a DMA engine already supported in Linux, uh, DMA engines can have support for a DMA memcopy operation, and this allows you to do just memcopies. There is an async memcopy uh, uh, function in the kernel that you can use to tell a DMA engine, please copy from here to there, and then you can try to circumvent uh, the address space isolation with it and see if you actually configure correctly the DMA isolation. Um, yeah, I have uh, more examples than I have time for, partially because I had fun uh, uh, remembering these issues and uh, prompting uh, Copilot, uh, Bing Copilot for the images. Uh, but yeah, I think uh, there is enough time for one. Uh, for the others, you can check out the slide on SCAD. And if you have questions, that just hit me up or uh, shoot me an email. Uh, so we had one of these uh, fancy NeoPixel LED strings. These work by having one NeoPixel that you give like four bytes with a very stringent frequency. I think it's 800 kilohertz or so. And it takes the first four bytes and then it passes along the four bytes after it. And that way uh, you can with some DMA, for example, PVM DMA or your audio interface uh, drive uh, a string of pixels uh, and people tend to do that on the Raspberry Pi from user space so you actually have a message box API to give you coherent memory from the Raspberry Pi and so you don't need to write kernel drivers at all you can just do it from user space on the Raspberry Pi which uh, makes me shudder a bit and yeah what some people ran into is that the file system on the SD card becomes became toast when they ran uh, projects like that. And yeah, it turns out uh, their memory corruption levels up from, uh, to a persistent memory corruption because uh, the DMA controller that was used, it has multiple channels. Some channels are already used by the kernel, but if you do fiddling from user space, you don't know what's used by the kernel or not. So you can end up using the same DMA channel that's used for the SD card. And yeah, then you have your uh, fancy LED pattern on your SD card overwriting your data, which is not as great. Um, yeah, 34 minutes, so I will skip over the, the rest of them, but you can check them out. Um, yeah, so to summarize, uh, the Linux Day DMA API serves its purpose quite well. You can write portably drivers that use DMA and they work on different CPUs and architectures for as long that you actually adhere to the DMA API. And the DMA API has to work with what's given. And what it's given is unannotated addresses. They don't have any lifetime. They don't have any ownership meta metadata. And so you as a programmer needs to keep care of that. And yeah, that's likely the main source of bugs. There is config DMA API debug, which is great. It does accounting for you, which is not done otherwise, but it's a debugging option. It's not enabled in production kernels and it just can't protect against everything. Uh, if you are interested in the topic of DMA safety, there was a talk like five years ago from Wolfram on it. But uh, yeah, I'm looking towards the future. I uh, have high hopes that with Rust, this can get better because in Rust with its more expressive type system, we will be able to encode some of these contracts that we have around the DMA API and actually check them at compile time. Uh, that's not to say any hope for C is lost, I think with uh, uh, sanitizers, we are able to do some of the stuff at runtime. So last week I implemented a proof of concept for Bearbox. Uh, so Bearbox has also kernel address sanitizer support and yeah, DMA AP debug support as I uh, mentioned. And I implemented a proof of concept that combines them to poison DMA buffers while they are owned by the device. So the way KSN works is that it poisons, it works like address sanitizer in user space, but it's for the kernel. It poisons 
buffers that you shouldn't access, memory like memory that's freed, and then in every memory access, you have a function that's called to check is the memory poisoned or not, and that way you can detect, oh, uh, you are accessing memory that's marked as poisoned, and the reason for poisoning is it's a DMA buffer owned by device. And that way, at the time that you do this access, you get an actual error message with a stack trace that tells you, hey, at this place, you are doing something you are not allowed to do. And yeah, it works in Bearbox. Uh, I am not sure how many bugs it's going to fix uh, or going to find, but I think it might be something for the kernel as well. Uh, so if you have any thoughts on that, please tell me. Uh, I learned last week too that kernel concurrency sanitizer can detect DMA races, but I haven't tried it myself. So I am, uh, don't know how uh, well that works. A glaring omission in my talk, I admit, there is nothing about IO MMUs, simply because I didn't have any SOC. Oh, uh, usually the SOCs that I work with don't have IO MMUs, but I look forward that in the future uh, they will bec become more common. And yes, yeah, that, uh, that should make stuff easier to be able to restrict devices in what kind of DMA they do. And for Bearbox, I am looking towards uh, fixing all remaining DMA AP debug warnings. A lot of them are like false positives, cache maintenance is done in another way, but uh, yeah, fixing them should allow the same uh, Bearbox drivers to also work on other architectures that are very different. Like on MIPS, you don't uh, have a, like a one-to-one -one address space, you have like a cached alias and uncached alias, and some of these drivers were config DMA AP debug once about, want to work on MIPS, but if we fix the warnings, they would work on MIPS, and yeah, that would be nice. Yeah, that concludes the talk. Uh, thank you for listening, and yeah, do you have any questions? <laughs> yes, please, uh, but I don't have a microphone, so you need to speak up. Um, so uh, the question is uh, address space uh, address space restriction on which architecture it is is it dependent so if you are using some say, uh, some um, uh, trusted operating system you need to secure it on all architectures because you don't want your non secure world or your normal world to just write into it so you always need to have some sort of isolation anywhere you are and yeah Can you repeat? The, the 40 bits, they don't come from a hardware limitation? Okay, now, now I'm confused. I was thinking you were talking about the Opti uh, info slide at the end. So it's a question because I, I don't know. I'm unsure if I missed that it is limited by hardware or, or it's a yeah, yeah. firmware limitation. Uh, okay, so the question is this 40 bit limit that was on the very first example, is it limited by hardware? Yes. So you buy an IP core and you connect it to the rest of your system and it was connected just with 40 address lines. So uh, worst case would be silent truncation and you would override something anywhere, somewhere in the system. But I had luck and uh, I got actually an exception, an interrupt from the uh, ST host controller telling me, hey, I have an ADMA error, which made it easier to track down because it also had the address that caused the issue. And then you could check, oh, it's always when it's above 40 bits. Thank you. Okay, then I think there are no other questions. Thank you for listening. And yeah, enjoy the attendee reception. <laughs>